Uh, as some of you may know, in his previous life, Martin was a medical doctor. And so today he will be running a pit clinic to help you with all your pit problems. So over to you, Martin. Thank you, Elena. And good morning, everyone, if you are in Europe or good afternoon if you're in Australia or Asia or I'm proud it's the middle of the night if you're sort of westwards in, in, in the Americas. Um, as Lena said, pit clinic is um, sort of I used the term because that is sort of my previous life I spent 20 years working as a medical doctor but sort of it's also about um, PID 101 and discuss sort of the common things we run into in a daily life, not just presentations of yet another PID that we need and somebody is working in on another project. But there's also the this part of working with PIDs. Um, I made the daring uh, proposal to say, please come with your questions. Um, but that's challenging, of course. So what I ask you to do is please start typing away your questions. Idly ask a question. If that's too complicated, just put it in the chat. If we have too many questions, which I hope we have, uh, we will keep them and continue them in the Slack. And what I will do while you type away uh, is sort of start with six questions that I have sort of made up because I have seen them, for example, reach our data site support or come up in general discussion. And the very first one is actually a user submitted one via Twitter last week. Um, and we start with that one. And I think uh, hopefully this is quite short that we don't spend um, the main part of the session on, on a single question, but that we can go through a few of them. And what I would really like, if you're asking a question and you're passionate about it, which I hope you are, that you come on stage and explain this in sort of not just in, in a text message, but verbally. Um, the first question is from Arthur Smith. And knowing that he lives in a time zone, which is in the middle of the night right now, I'm not sure whether he is on this call. So maybe just say something if you are Arthur. Um, but I will get started with this question, which is a rather technical one. So I'm not sure how many of you have sort of run into this problem yourself. But it's basically case sensitivity of the internet, if you will. And um, that's a rather tricky topic if you go into details. Oh, Arthur, do you want to come on stage and ex explain your problem? Yeah, I I'm very proud of you. 5 a.m. in New York. but. Case sensitivity is super important. Um, can can you do that? Add, add him to the. Uh, I did, but he rejected the invitation, so maybe he prefers to comment in chat. <laughs> it's also five five a.m. You might not be quite uh, at your coffee, etc. So um, everything is case sensitive in URLs, and PIDs are usually. Um, sort of made actionable using URLs, and we come back to this later. Um, and a good example is YouTube, where um, each YouTube video has an identifier, and they use something called Base64, which is sort of a, a random string, which is case sensitive. And that works fine, and that's how the internet works. On the other hand, persistent identifiers might not be case sensitive. And a good example is DUIs, where case shouldn't matter. And how do you bring the two together? And of course, if you use ORCID IDs for people, you, you are lucky because they just use numbers and hyphens and there's no case problem other than the X that can sometimes be used. <clears throat> um, their approach that DOI registration agencies have taken is to say, the UIs are case uh, insensitive, so all your infrastructure should ignore the case. But that's not really practical. OK, I will get back to that question later. Um, so what uh, DataSite had done when it started 10 years ago is make all DOIs uppercase. And that was also the original recommendation of the DOI Foundation many years ago. 
but that didn't really feel practical because even though URLs are case insensitive in many other places, the common practice that we're all used to is lowercase. Um, and that's why um, we have sort of started to display DUIs in lowercase a few uh, years ago in a data site and have um, following the best practice to whatever comes in, we take it and don't make a distinction between a DUI and uppercase and lowercase. And I think that's probably true for, for other PIP providers as well, that you have to be quite flexible in the input, but should really um, not make things more complicated by sort of making distinction in, in case. Um, unfortunately, uh, we haven't solved that part of the internal um, connecting systems to each other. And I think that's, that's what Arthur is aiming at in the sort of second part of this question. It's really painful if you case insensitive string matches is easy in some systems and painful in others. And we are struggling with this um, as well. So I'm not sure that's a full answer, but I would say um, the internet at the end of the day expects lowercase uh, for everything in the URL, unless there's a very special reason. Um, and that's what should be sort of the display of DUIs, but internally you have to be able to manage whatever case comes in. Do you want to comment on this, Arthur? I hope you didn't hope for, <laughs> for a magic uh, trick or anything. Okay, there's a, a helpful comment from Paul Jestop about case DUI case and sensitivity being limited to ASCII, which is sort of it's the internet in the 1990s. Unicode case sensitivity applies because basically it's not yeah, the lowercase and uppercase character becomes much too difficult once you have the uh, the character set of Unicode, which goes into thousands. Um, I think we move on. Um, and maybe I just take Jan's question now because he sort of just asked that, which is characters in PITS, which you see a use case to use Unicode characters outside of the SC range in PITS, like Greek or Cyrillic or Arabic letters. Um, it is supported, but it makes life hard. Um, and I would say, and I come back to this sort of, do you want to express any meaning in the pit? And if you're not, then Latin characters is probably the easiest way, the safest way that your pit is not garbled when you transmit it in, um, in various forms. Um, it, but it is possible. Um, th there are sort of many funny characters, including non-printing characters that you can use in DUIs. And, that you should totally avoid because it just makes your life hard. And the same goes for characters that have special meaning in URLs. So colons and um, things like that. So I think a PID character set should be something that everybody can easily create and display. And there's no sort of hid hidden tricks in there that you need to do something special to do that, et cetera. Um, there was one other question that I think is now moved to ask a question, um, which was by Eben. Does it make sense to assign ORCIDs to organizations? Um, do you want to elaborate on this in, in the chat or even coming on, on, on stage? Um, okay, so the short answer, no. Orchid specifically, for example, in contrast to ISNI, focused on people from the beginning. And to my knowledge, it hasn't changed even in the thinking. Um, there's identifiers for organizations like Roar. There's identifiers for people. I think the tricky territory, maybe that's what you're referring to, is not um, legal entities as organizations, but informal collaboration teams, uh, etc., lab groups, which, for example, are extremely common as auth 
applications. And that's sort of a middle ground that's not covered by ROAR or ORCID. Is that sort of where you're aiming at with this question? I think Eames coming on stage. I see him connecting. Good. Yep. Uh, apologies, my dog has uh, decided now is the time to start barking. Um, I think you answered the question already, uh, Martin, but uh, just the context was that um, we want to have uh, identifiers within our systems for organizations, and we're thinking about things. Sorry, uh, I, need to, yeah, I, need, I need to go and get the door. Sorry about this. Uh, okay. okay, so yeah, I, I just tried to extrapolate what you put in the Slack because that your dog decided to make himself or herself know at this moment is unfortunate timing. Um, so, so maybe we can agree that there is a need for for the middle ground where an organization is not so formal, there's an identifier and there's sort of obviously more than one system to provide that. I mentioned raw, but again, there's uh, others. Um, but what do you do with a team of four people or 12 people that work together? Um, you have more formal teams of people, for a good example is CERN and the collaborations they have where they just have thousands of authors. And of course they have started managing um, them in a more systematic way and not just listing by by name. Um, I think that's a gap and that's sort of very much getting close to discussions we had in previous sessions, which is, um, for example, project identifiers, grant identifiers, and DMPs as data management plan as an umbrella to bring things together, which could also be these other people that worked on this project that you want them to sort of bring together using an identifier so you can link it to other things like funding, et cetera. Um, and I don't think there is a sort of solution about this sort of collective author. And I think collaboration is a good term for that is commonly used for authorship where we can where I can propose a solution now, but let's let's agree that this is that is an unaddressed problem, and it, it's basically the problem that these collaborations are very uh, much much softer than a legal entity, and so having something that's persistent but can change uh, every few months is sort of that's a conundrum. So if we move on, and I hope you're fine that we go through a few questions rather than sort of completely answering everything and going in every detail. And again, we could continue on, on Slack. Um, so the next question that I put up, and I hope it's, um, it's a reasonable question, should all pits be resolvable via the URL? Um, is that something, obviously, uh, you can see where I'm going. And does anyone in the audience think there is value in having a PIT that's it's a unique identifier, but it's not actionable? You cannot actually do something with it unless you know what you have to do. So so I hope the yes means yes, every um, PIT should be should be able to be expressed as a URL, which is just the way how we connect things uh, in today's world. Maybe that's different in five or ten years. Um, and sort of the URI, sort of the the cousin, which is it's unique, and you can use it to sort of identify things, but you can only really do something with it that is um, just such a difference that it's it's pits are not just about naming things but doing something useful with them and i would strongly um encourage this uh, for some pit, pit systems including device where i work at data side but orchids roars isnies so that it's very easy to make something actionable um and let's just say yes this is needed Next one is tricky, and it's I'm not sure there's an answer that we can have in, in the next uh, 10 minutes. How do you version the PIT? It comes up all the time. There are sort of many different approaches. I can only um, say 
what I think is important. And, and the first thing is versions of a thing um, is super important. There are some exceptions where versioning might not be so important. I would say for people, that's true. People sometimes reinvent themselves, but it's probably still the same person. Um, but for everything else, there can be versions, whether it's five versions because you update a text document or whether it's thousands of versions because you have software or data that change quickly. Um, so it's a common problem. And I think versioning is one of those things that just create a lot of confusion. And basically, uh, everybody does it slightly differently. There is, of course, a lot of activity to align this. Good example is research data alliance, but I think we are not there. Um, the first thing I would say, um, if the PID has metadata, which most PIDs have, please put the version in the metadata, because then it's not just a, a string which says version 3, but it actually says, this is a newer version of this other PID. Um, and that's much more useful than just saying, oh, there is this is a version of something, and now I have to figure out where I find that other version. So that's the first thing I would do. Um, for DUIs, I often see people putting a version in the DUI name. So there is 1234v.v1 or something. And it's really important to understand that because you can put everything into the DUI name, you can do that, but there is no system that sort of understands that. You could also put something totally else in there. Or v1 might not be a version, but just might be something else you want to put in the uh, UI name. So there is no standard way of doing versioning in the PID itself, in the UI system. Uh, there's metadata. Um, and that's, that's true for other PID systems in part. There, of course, there are PIDs that don't come with metadata, or the metadata is not in the central place or the standard schema that everybody uses. And then, of course, many, many people put versions in into the PID string. Um, and for me, um, this creates problems because that's sort of the next question, which is, should there be any meaning in a PID? And once you start doing it, it becomes really tricky, in particular because the rules you use for extracting information out of a PID uh, will be very fragile because every PID system or even every user of the same PID system does it slightly differently. Any comments on that? I mean, version is really, we could have a whole session on versioning. Actually, that's what I did last Pillarpalooza. But in the sort of the version in the PID strings, any, anybody in the audience want to say, yes, we should do this, and we should agree how we do that. OK, so Jonathan is putting a comment on uh, URLs are fine, but we should, should assume they're still around 100 years, and there might be other ways to action a pit. Um, so. OK, people are still stuck with that point. So let's, if versioning is something that nobody is, um, has strong opinions, otherwise we move on to the next question, which is sort of the more general, not just for versioning. Should we aim for opaque identifiers, avoiding any semantic information, e.g. publisher repository name, year version order? in PIDs if possible. And order means, for example, Orchid make, made a very um, specific decision when it launched that, um, and that's not different from ISNI that uses the same um, numbering scheme. You cannot look at, at, at an Orchid and say, oh, this is one of the first 1,000 Orchids that were registered. So that's sort of a different. Or you can say, um, as for example, you can have a research ID or this identifier was registered in 2012 or something. So everybody who's doing PITs will preach, don't put semantic information in there. And the main reason is that this information will change over time, in particular names for organizations, etc. Um, 
sorry, I'm trying to see what's happening in the Slack channel, which is, uh, okay. So Paul Jessop is saying, semantic identifiers are disaster area, should always be opaque, but this is sort of what I expect from Jonathan and Paul. The problem is when you talk to researchers, and this is quite common in, for example, life sciences, that there is semantics in there and that um, people think it makes their life easier if they can look at identifier and can say, oh, this is from this data repository, for example. Um, uh, another example is namespaces, where you can have namespaces that are just sort of opaque numbers, like the DUI system or the handle system in general. Um, but of course, you can also have namespaces like uh, in the life sciences, where each sort of uh, repository has a unique namespace that at least uh, for the popular ones, people uh, understand. Um, so maybe this audience here is a little bit biased. It, it, I don't see any anybody standing up saying, yes, semantic information makes the life of the end user easier. And then there's sort of maybe some nuance in this. Okay, so that's not a topic that needs a deeper discussion at this point, and we can continue on Slack. Um, let's see what else I have in terms of the questions that have been asked. Can orchids be assigned to deceased persons such as Shakespeare? Um, that's by David Schotten, and that's something that, again, Orchid decided early on, no. If you care about Shakespeare or Albert Einstein or other people who are important in science and culture, use an ISNI. Um, and I don't think that this policy has changed. And that's one good reason is that uh, Orchid is very much about the researcher controls the information about him or her, and that's just impossible um, if if somebody else assigns an identifier to somebody who no longer lives. Should a researcher after brain surgery register for the ORCID ID? Uh, Jan, I assume that's half seriously because then, yeah. Uh, you could argue that there is also, that if something dramatic happens to a person, um, including, of course, serious illness or operation or other near-death experience, you might think you're not the same anymore, but I think that's more a, a discussion on another level, not a pit discussion. Um, next question in, in the ask the question is, metadata is attached to a pit, but how? Should there be more of a standard for how to get the metadata from a pit resolver? I think that's a wonderful question, which probably could take um, quite a while to discuss. Um, what we see in several PIT systems is content negotiation, which of course is also a standard way of how um, the internet works where basically a PIT by default resolves to a page that has more information about the thing that's described by the PIT. If for some reason, instead of that, you want the metadata, you can do content negotiation and then you can maybe have multiple metadata formats you can choose from. So for DUIs, for example, that might be uh, the metadata, um, an XML format that, for example, Crossref provides, but for the same Crossref ID, you might instead want BibTeX or some other um, format used to generate citations. So I think content negotiation is a standard way of doing this. The only limitation I see with content negotiation is that it's really for a single PIT. So if you say, I have these 1,000 DUIs, for example, please give me the metadata for 1,000 and content negotiation. Um, the way it's implemented right now uh, probably doesn't scale so well. Um, I think what in practice happens is that everybody provides REST APIs where you get this information. Um, and that's probably good enough in a practical sense, even though that's not standardized. And for example, the JSON might look 
slightly different for everyone. Martin, can I suggest you answer one last question so that we give everyone a couple of minutes to move to the next session? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, I was fully aware we will not be able to um, get to everything. So, so maybe I, I have a last question that I made up, but I think it comes up a lot, which is, are multiple pits for the same thing, e.g. a publication, data set, person, et cetera, a problem? And in, in sort of, in spite of the time, I would say, not it's not the problem, it's very common, it's impossible to avoid that because there's different use cases, there's history and, and so forth. So it's really about linking pits together. Um, that, oh, there's sort of these three other identifiers for the same thing. Um, and that just support this instead of saying, well, there can only be one pit that um, rules everything. Okay, and I think with that, I thank you all for your attention. I will just say short DUIs are a historic thing that is really has not picked up and is not something that I would suggest to anyone using, but uh, please move to your next session or continue in this Slack like, if you have further questions. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Martin. Um, then let's give everyone a couple of minutes to pick their next session and we will be back in four minutes with the next session. Thank you.